You know, songs were wonderful this morning. Uh, can you all hear me okay? Is it? Hmm. Don't know if it's working. Is it working all right? Okay. There we go. <laughs> uh, just glad you all are here this morning. And, uh, you know, one of the great things that we as, uh, well, actually students, those students we have in here, uh, you can say kind of a hallelujah because you're out of school. Some of you guys have been out of school for a little bit longer. I see waving hands, woohoo, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, parents, in about a week, uh, it's really going to get to you, you know, because they're going to run out of things to do, run out of food in the house. I know that happens really quick in our, our house, too. Uh, you know, I started, uh, um, I've been working with the school system, too, and, and uh, I, I guess I started an early vacation this morning because, uh, you know, I, I came in into church here, you know, and, and I'm like, wow, you know, I'm a little bit earlier today. This, this is going well. Uh, and, you know, I'm like, I, I was just starting to feel, you know, and I, and I felt my face, and I realized I forgot to shave. Now, I do have a beard, but I actually forgot to shave around this area, and it had been a couple days. So I, I called my wife up, and I said, hon, can you please bring the razor and shaving cream, because I just totally forgot it. Uh, you know, it, it is like I'm on vacation here. I've, I've, that makes a lot of sense why I was early and why, you know, okay, there, there's, there's a few minutes of, of time I made up. So, um, you know, the other thing that kind of comes to mind is the fact that many of us are going to be going on vacation, uh, traveling different places, and uh, look, we're going to have a little bit of a discussion about that today. Uh, but before we uh, really get started with that, I, I wanted to read the main passage that we're going to be talking about today. And that passage comes to us in Mark 1, 35 to 38. So you can open up your Bibles if you have them. Otherwise, uh, they'll be on the, the verse will be on the backboard. Uh, but this is a time not long after Jesus has chosen his disciples. And he begins to, uh, the path down his ministry, traveling uh, really from uh, Nazareth, Nazareth to Capernaum and, and, and so on. So in Mark 1, 35 to 38, this is what happens. It says this, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him, and when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, Let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in the synagogues and driving out demons. Uh, many have actually had the privilege of going to the promised land. I wonder if there, is there anybody here that's actually been to the promised land? Been, okay, there's, there's a few hands going up. That's, that's pretty amazing. Uh, to actually see the places that Jesus walked. Now, most of the time, uh, those are guided tours. And uh, where folks get onto these, these huge tour buses. And I'm not sure exactly what kind of trip you had. Uh, but they're driven down the road to visit various uh, holy sites where, where Jesus would have been. And um, actually, a little while ago, somebody put a, 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 together a 40-mile hiking path called the Jesus Trail. Uh, and that, it's actually going to pop up in behind here. Kaylee, if you want to pop that up. Um, there we go. And this is, it's really hard to see, but it's actually a kind of a map, and you can see how there are different points, that, and they're numbered where you can see the, the different places. In fact, there's even a little sign on the right that says... Um, uh, it's, it's underneath there, but uh, it, it's, it talks about, and get your favorite taxi driver to take you. You know, it's kind of a, this, this whole commercialized Jesus Trail idea that you can just go and check things out and, and see the sights and, and that sort of thing. Um, the, you can download GPS coordinates. Um, you can pick up trail maps. You can get tourist uh, sites, uh, you know, and, and actually, uh, you know, they have like little gift shops and that kind of thing all along the way. Uh, the path is meant to be hiked in four days, and you can start off the trail in Nazareth. You can sleep in the town where Jesus lived um, as a boy, and then as you hike the trail, you can stay at an occasional guest houses, or you can carry tents with you and, and camp out along the path. Um, tour buses only stop at the, the known holy sites, but this path, here's what's different about this path, is, is that it lets you actually see the flowers uh, and sense the feel of the land as you walk for four days where Jesus walked. So that's pretty amazing. And if you think about it, uh, you know, how many of y'all have, have driven through a town or a city, and, and as you're driving through, and you're, it's, it's really kind of a pass-through on the way to your destination, you, you look and say, wow, that'd be a, 
great place to spend some time. And uh, it's hard to experience the things within that place if you're just typically driving through to get to a destination. Um, but see, that's tourism. That's, that's sightseeing. And uh, to get that feel for, where, uh, for what it's like to live in those cities, you, you really have to, to walk as Jesus walked. You have to walk as those people in those cities will walk. Um, New York City, you really cannot get anywhere unless you walk. Uh, or you can take the, take the metro or whatever it is. There, there's really only certain ways you can travel in New York City. Forget the car. Forget the car. You do not want to drive in New York City. Uh, let the taxi cab drivers, let them handle that. Uh, if anybody's been there before, uh, you probably know what I'm talking about. Uh, we, we actually stayed about 30 minutes outside of New York City and took a, a train that took us uh, in, into the station. We got off, and we just, uh, we, our kids were old enough. They, we actually had them uh, both in strollers as last year. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I know where, where Jacob is. Yeah. Anyways, I think he's got that smile. It's kind of fun. So, anyways, it's, it's, uh, pretty, it's really nice to be able to walk and see that life and see what it's like to live in these places. If you and I really want to walk as Jesus walked, we need to learn to live like Jesus. And one of the most prominent parts of Jesus' life was his prayer life. And, and, and uh, that's kind of what this, this passage is talking about. One scholar actually read through the book of Matthew, and he focused on the top ten topics that Jesus taught. Coming at number nine was prayer. There were 46 verses in the, in the book of Matthew. Somebody else did a study on all four of the Gospels and found that there were 17 different times when we're told that Jesus prayed. They found that, uh, and there's a, actually it's going to pop up in behind me, it says they found that he prayed early in the morning, late at night, all through the night. He also prayed at the beginning of his ministry. He prayed before he chose his 12 disciples. He prayed before healing the crowds. He prayed before he fed the 5,000. He prayed before bringing Lazarus back to life. He prayed before his transfiguration. He prayed at the Mount of Olives before being betrayed. And he prayed while he was on the cross. So Jesus is now at the right hand of God, and he's also interceding for us. And, and you see, if, if we want to walk today where Jesus walked, you and I need to learn to kneel as Jesus, Jesus knelt. We have to understand what he was doing at these different times. Many, many folks have a problem when it comes to a preacher actually getting up here and, and preaching on prayer. Um, and the reason is because it's kind of a guilt thing. This, this, is, this is what happens. They, you feel guilty because you don't feel like you pray enough throughout the week. And that's me included. There's this whole guilt thing. And when you're, when you're writing a sermon like this and you're talking about prayer, let me tell you something. It is humbling because you realize how little you actually do pray during the week. Have you ever felt guilty about that? I'm just wondering if you have. I know I have. And a lot of good Christians, they beat themselves up over the fact that they don't spend as much time as they'd like in prayer. Um, I don't think the problem, though, is the amount of time that we spend in prayer. And we're going to talk about this. I think the problem is that many Christians see prayer as an obligation. They see it as something that you have to do, not something that you get to do. Uh, I'm going to hold this up, and most of you all have one of these. It's a, it's a smartphone. Uh, my son has a dumb phone. We uh, purposely did that because, uh, you know, there's just... Too much he can get into, I think. He bugs me all the time about it. My daughter also, she, she has a dumb phone, and that's kind of a choice by parents. And we said, hey, if you want a smartphone, you can pay the extra 30 or $40 a month because that's what it, what it comes down to when, when you're paying for that. So you got to go earn that money and take care of it. But, <clears throat> you know, if, if, you, if you look at this phone, I can, I can play games on it. I can write notes to myself, uh, you know, as reminders. I can put things in my calendar, I can surf the internet, I can send texts, emails, I can tweet, or I can do what you should really do with a phone, and that's actually talk on it. It's, it's pretty amazing. You can talk on these things, too. I, I'm not, you know, I don't really see people do it too often. I've been in many rooms where you just see rows of people. And I see pictures on the internet all, all the time about that, just like this, right? I mean, there could be, like, Jesus coming back right here. You know, here's Jesus you know, this, he's, he's coming back, heaven and earth are colliding, 
do you see what's happening next to us? Text, text, text. You know, I mean, this, this is basically what's, what life is like now, right? It, there's communication happening, but it's not actually coming through our mouths. So there's a lot that you can do with this little phone. Uh, but let me ask you this. Do you think I worry about how little I use my phone? Do I worry about that? Nobody really worries about using their phones too little, to be honest with you. Uh, in fact, if, if anything, people worry about using their phones too much because you know what happens? When you start getting those overages and then your data plan is run out and, and you're like, oh, I just got to check this, and all of a sudden you get that nice big bill, people are really trying, they will limit themselves as to how much they use their phones because there's going to be a hefty sum if you go over those limits. Some of y'all may have an unlimited plan. Right, uh, I've I've kept my same plan for years, and I've got unlimited data on this thing. It's great. It is so nice. Um, most people you get you get your your two your two gigs or four, you know that that kind of thing. So, um, but but there's unlimited, and no matter how many minutes you use your phones, uh, or text, or surf the internet, or, or call, it's good because it's all covered. You're good to go. I use my phone many times throughout the day. I really do. In fact, they've become so much a part of people's lives that there's a phenomena, listen to this, called phantom vibration. I, I think you know what I'm talking about, right? You, you leave your phone sitting somewhere, and then all of a sudden, you feel like a vibration in your pocket, right? How many of y'all have had this happen before? Oh, yeah? If you haven't, I think you guys are missing out on this, because th this, is, this, is this is the truth, okay? I have, like, reached my pocket and realized there's no phone there, and I, I swear it was vibrating. It's like, what in the world? I always keep it there. Some of you guys keep it on your hips. Some of you guys, ladies, maybe keep it in your purses. Uh, you know, I, I don't know. But if you've kept it in your pocket for a while, you get phantom vibration. This is a true phenomenon. And it's when you carry this phone in your shirt, your pants pocket, um, nobody ever worries about using their phones too much, though, because we all, we all need it. We find that we need it. So why do I use my cell phone so much? Why do I do that? Is it because I feel guilty if I don't? Do I feel guilty by not using my phone? Is it because I feel an obligation to use my cell phone? It's like, oh, I've got my 700 minutes. I've got to make sure I run it up to those 700 minutes there. I've got to make sure I take care of this. Of course not. You do not feel an obligation to use your phone, do you? All right? Now, if you don't have your phone... You feel like there's a part of your life missing. What in the world? It's like, I'm disconnected from society. This is also a syndrome, too, uh, with, with Facebook and social media, where people actually feel like they are disconnected from what's going on in the world. If they don't look at their phone for like a day or two, and they don't see that, what everybody's wondering. I see a lot of people just like jabbing people. It's kind of fun, you know, just as I'm talking about this, because everybody knows what I'm talking about. You feel disconnected from society. But here's the thing is that I use my cell phone because I understand its value to me. And here's the thing is that many people see prayer as a religious obligation. You got to do it because it's what religious folks do. And, and if we end up being like those pagans um, who think they can be heard for their many prayers, that's kind of that's our idea is that we don't want to be like those pagans, right? We don't want to be like those people who are just, just praying or, or saying things outward just so they can kind of show off, right? And I use the word pagans for a reason. We're going to talk about that. But there are folks who actually look at Muslims and they say, look how religious they are. They pray five times a day. Now, have you ever heard somebody say that about, about Islam and, and so on? Okay. Uh, their prayers, listen to this, they are nothing more than recitations, okay? They're reciting specific prayers. They memorize it. They recite it from memory. It's a religious obligation for them. Their prayers aren't heartfelt prayers. They're religious commitments. They have to do this. Now, let me ask you this. Do you think that's how Jesus prayed? Uh, I've got to run here real quick to Gethsemane and make sure I, I say my prayer because I have to do it. I have to do this, okay? Oh, uh, guys, I'll be back in about five minutes. I've got to go, go pray to God real quick, okay? I have to do this. I have to do this. Do you think he prayed because he saw it as a commitment that he had to fulfill? Of course not. He did not. 
Jesus didn't pray to fulfill an obligation. When he prayed, he did so because he felt the need to pray. He felt that need to pray. We've been going to school here the last five weeks. You guys have all been given assignments each week. Sometimes it's a continuing assignment. And, you know, think about an assignment. Uh, and if, for those of you that, that are in school, that are teachers, that go to school, everybody's been in school. Okay? When you get an assignment, you know what's difficult about that is you don't want to do it. You really don't want to do it because somebody is telling you to do that thing. Now, if it were something that you were doing on your own, if you came up with that idea, guess what? Hey, listen to this awesome idea I came up with. Listen to what's happening here. You're excited about it, but not because somebody is telling you. It's because you want to do it. Not everybody believes that Jesus actually felt the need to pray. Listen to this. As I was researching this text, I encountered a following quote from a a famous commentator named Adam Clark who implied that Jesus didn't really need to pray. He said, commenting on, on our text for this morning, he wrote this, he said this, Not that Jesus needed anything, for in him dwelt all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Now, was Clark right? Was he right? Did the fullness of the Godhead really dwell inside Jesus? Well, that's what Colossians uh, 2.9 says. It says, For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. So, so Clark was right. Jesus was God in the flesh. The fullness of the Godhead dwelt inside his human body. However, what Clark is implying is this, that Jesus didn't actually need to pray. The only reason he did so was to put on a show for our benefit. Now, what do you think about that? What do you think about that? See, I'm going to tell you, that's all wrong. That's all wrong. Jesus needed to pray. And the proof of the fact was how Jesus prayed. Many times Jesus would get up and and go off by himself to pray. Sometimes he'd pray all night by himself. He wept when he prayed. And once when he prayed, he bled drops of blood. I actually spoke about that last week. To say that Jesus was doing his prayers for show would be to put our Savior on the same level as the Pharisees. Do you understand what that's saying? Who did all their praying for show. But Jesus did not pray for show. He prayed because he needed to pray. But now, wait a minute. If if, if Jesus was actually God, why on earth would he need to pray well, several reasons come to mind, but I'm, I'm going to focus on two main reasons this morning. We're going to talk about these two main reasons. In your bulletins, you'll be able to fill out these reasons why he needed to pray. So Philippians 2.5.8 tells us this. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, He made himself nothing nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. So Jesus literally set aside his own godness to come down to earth. Do you understand what he did? It was not necessary for him to come to earth. It really wasn't, but he did. He did. He surrendered his divinity, and he allowed himself to be clothed in human flesh. He gave up the safety of heaven and exposed himself to to hunger, to thirst, to pain, to sorrow, to need, to all these things that we experience as humans. He dealt with this. He dealt with these same things. When Jesus became human, it wasn't like putting on a Halloween costume. It wasn't like he was pretending to be something he wasn't. He set aside who he was to become what we are. He took that step, a big step down for us, a huge step. Because Jesus became what we are, he needed to pray like what we do. He was no longer God in godly robes. He was now God in human flesh. I want you to think about that. When we, you you see those pictures of of Jesus, right, of of God and and, God. you see him in these, these nice white flowing robes, right? People have beautiful paintings, and that's kind of that image that we have of Jesus. But he lived in a dirty, stinky old earth. He did. He came down from heaven 
to be like us, to experience what we experienced. He became what we are. Being human meant he was faced with the same weaknesses and limitations that we are. And when Jesus prayed, he prayed for the same reasons that we do. So a couple of reasons that he prayed are these. Uh, number one, he needed prayer for strength. Uh, one man asked this question, uh, where was it that Jesus, where Jesus' sweat was like great drops of blood? Was it when he was being put on trial before the Sanhedrin, uh, before Herod, before, before Pilate? Was it while he was being beaten by the Roman soldiers? Was it while he was carrying his cross up the hill to, to Calvary? No, it was not. It was in the Garden of Gethsemane. We're told that during the days, and this is in Hebrews 5, 7, during the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of, because of his reverent submission. Now, we spoke about this a little bit last week. We spoke about how we can be in places that are dark, but yet God brings us into the light. So first, Jesus prayed for strength. So let me ask you this. If Jesus needed to pray for strength, should we? Should we? Yes. We should. Guess what? We are not strong enough to survive this world. Do you understand that? We are not. We are going to crash and burn if we decide that we can handle things our own. It's real simple. I'm, I'm a guy, I like to have control. I do. I like to know that thing, a, a is going to connect to B, and I like to know that things are going to be fun and that bills are going to be paid and that electric's going to be on and that you know, air conditioning is going to be fixed. and all these. I like to know that this is taken care of. But what happens when it's not? What do we do? What do we do? Well, hopefully, hopefully we're turning to God even more, right? Hopefully. Second, Jesus prayed for direction. In our text this morning, we, we read about Jesus being in Capernaum, and it's been a powerful time in his ministry. People are amazed at his teaching. People are healed of demon possession and various diseases. But then in, in Mark 135, we're told that very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Jesus had been gone so long that his disciples finally came to find him. How many of y'all just disappeared for a while? You decided, you know what? I just got to get away. I just got to get away. I, I can't handle things going on. Uh, anybody in college, there's times it's like, ah, finals, ah, right? Anybody in school, teachers, anybody that's got a deadline, I just got to get away. I got to get away. This is, this is what happened. Jesus got away. And... They were waiting for, people were waiting for him to show up, and he had been nowhere to be found. What did he think he was doing? Uh, in an answer to, to their rebuke, this is what Jesus replied. He said, let us go somewhere else. This is Mark one thirty eight, To the nearby villages, so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. Just like that, Jesus decides to up and leave a, a totally successful area. Now, again, we like to build things. We like to see projects finished. We like to be able to see that people are doing well. We like to be able to see that our, we had an impact in society. But you know what? He wasn't, he wasn't worried about that. He knew what his mission was. He knew what he was supposed to do. And when he left, he left. He did what he was supposed to do, and he left. See, too many times, I believe, churches, we as people... We like to give, we like to do, we like to have these missions, and we want to see results immediately, right? This, this is what happens. We want to see that people are doing well because of what we have done, because the money we've given, because these gifts we've given. We want to see that not only are people taken care of, but here's the other thing is that we want to make sure we get some glory for it, right? Is this not the church of today? Is this not what's happening? And is this not why we've become more worldly when we should be more godly? We want to 
give shoes. We want to uh, make sure that everything we do is, is uh, focused on a person. It's not focused on the body. This is the problem that we have with church. But see, Jesus, what he did is he went in, he served, he shared, and he left and allowed others to do what they needed to do. He had that trust in others. He had that trust in his disciples. He had that trust in his believers that they would be able to carry on when he was gone. So he ups and leaves, and <laughs> there's a, it's this place where people are literally breaking down the door to be with him, to touch him, to, to feel him, to be next to him, to hear his preaching. They, they've come from miles around to hear him preach and see him do these miracles, and then suddenly... Jesus decides it's time to go somewhere else. Why would he do that? Why does he do that? Here's the thing, is that he had spent time in prayer. Before this decision, he had spent time in prayer. He had been involved in a strategy session with the Father. (laughs) Think about that. When he came out of prayer, he set his face towards plowing more ground for the kingdom. His prayer had refocused his purpose and goal. This is why I've come. It's real easy to get caught up in the things that are happening. But Jesus, real, he knew it. He was refocused. And immediately he says, we must go. We must go. Yeah, I can imagine the disciples, but, 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 uh, we got a five o'clock gig, you know? We, we got something. Else. There are people that are expecting us here, Jesus. Come on. Come on. They're like showing up. We've got to go. It wasn't about that. It was about making sure he stayed focused on what he was called to do. That's a major reason why you and I need prayer. I can promise each one of you, I know for me also, sometimes we lose our way. Sometimes we lose our focus. Sometimes we don't even know why we're on this earth. We really don't. We've lost our focus so much. What am I going to do when I grow up? You know, there are 60, 70, 80-year-olds that are still asking that same question. What am I going to do when I grow up? What am I here for? And you know what? It's not a bad thing to ask God that same question. God, why am I here? Why am I here? If you try to figure it out on your own, you're going to be going all different directions, I promise you. If you go to where this professor or this guy on TV is telling you to go, you're not going to be happy. You have to understand that God has put you on this planet for a reason. Everybody has a different reason The main goal is that we are here to to reach others, to make disciples of all the nations, but you all have gifts. God is going to use those gifts. You will not be able to understand those gifts, understand how to use those gifts, if you are not in a strategy session with God. You're not. We need to talk over our plans with God. We need to ask His guidance. We need to seek His will. As Psalm 127.1 says, it says, unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand watch in vain. Who's built your house? Have you done it? Have your parents done it? Have your friends done it? Who's built your house? Has God built your house? You realize that when we pray that, that God gets in our minds and, and tinkers with our thinking, uh, prayer literally changes our minds. In fact, there's uh, been recent research that proves that very thing. Several doctors from the University of Pennsylvania recently authored a study where they demonstrated that praying actually changes the physiology of the brain. Prayer changes you. Prayer makes you become who you need to become. But God said that a long time ago. Prayer changes us. It brings us into contact uh, with the Almighty Father so that He can reach us and reach into that gray matter that we call our brains, and direct and guide us. See, we want all the science side, but here's the thing, is that God has a, he's got a direct connection if we allow it. We try to figure out the physiology, we try to figure out the makeup, how does the Zika virus affect this, okay? Um, These are things that we're wondering about, right? If my brain shrinks by a centimeter, okay? I mean, honestly, we are so much about the science, we have to show why things work. And do you understand that That's not even necessary. We are people who built the Tower of Babel only for God to knock it down. And why is that? 
because we need God. He knows we need him, but we want to try to reach that goal. We want to try to reach that place without him. We have a direct line to God. We don't need a tower to build up to him, do we? We have a direct line. He's here for us. It occurred to me that as I was preparing the sermon, the Bible never actually teaches us about how long we should pray. Did you know that? That, that nobody ever asked Jesus. They said, how long should I be praying, Jesus? Uh, five minutes? Is that, is that good enough? Do I need, you know, maybe uh, at 12 o'clock, do I need to go and, and uh, find some carpet and sit down on it and pray at that time? Is, is that what I need to do? Is there a certain way that I need to pray? Is there a certain time I need to pray to you? But, you know, I guess it makes perfect sense that, you know, uh, if, I, if I were to call Randy uh, here on, and he answers, um, and then uh, do you think I would actually ask Randy, uh, how long should we talk today, Randy? How long should we talk, Randy? Have you ever done that with any conversation with anybody? Have you ever said, uh, how long should we be on this phone conversation right here? You don't. First of all, be rude. And if you were trying to get a date on the phone call, you may as well forget about it, right? Okay? It's not going to happen. Okay? But listen, you don't ask that question. It would, it would be, it implies that you don't really want to talk with that person. That's really what it's implying. You're putting a time limit on the conversation. How do you do that? So it's interesting how Jesus' disciples didn't ask how much they should pray. They asked him how to pray. Okay, now we're going to get into how to pray. So let's do a quick look at what Jesus taught them. And you guys know this. Okay, repeat after me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. All right, stop right there. Notice what Jesus is actually teaching us to do here. Start your prayers by focusing on God. It's what you do. He's our Father. You're talking to God who loves you. People are so scared of God. Listen, do we need to fear the fact that we won't be with him possibly? Yeah. But he is a loving father. He is a father. Maybe for some of us, he's the only father we've ever known. The only true father. He loves us. He welcomes us back. A lot of us have children, grandchildren. Some of us don't, but you and I both know that the kids ask for stuff. Oh, man, and it's, it's happening even more this summer. Oh, tell you what. Daddy, can I have this? Mommy, can I have that? What are we going to eat? Starts ask for, <laughs> they start asking for toys, then money, then the keys to the car. Okay, so, man, it was a lot easier when, when they were little. Okay, yes, here, it's a quick toy, you know, whatever it is, okay? That's a lot cheaper than a car, okay? We're having to deal with some rough things right now. I got a daughter who's 16, a son who's 14, getting ready to turn 15, I told him, yes, son, I've got, a, I've got a vehicle for you, but guess what? You're working on it. You guys have got to pay for it. We're going to work on it together, though. We are going to work on it together. <laughs> As parents, uh, parents, they don't have problems doing that typically, right? We would, would we do anything for our kids? Yes, we would. But have you ever had a child just come up and sit on your lap? Like out of the blue, just come and sit on your lap? I think this has happened, right? Uh, last week I talked about a, a lady who was in a dark room and uh, all of a sudden she felt a hand grab her hand and it was a, some kid she didn't even know, okay? Well, she needed, you know, that, that kid needed somebody. Needed some to make them feel safe. But when somebody comes and sits on your lap, a kid, they're there because they want to be with you. Do you understand that? My wife talks to me about that all the time and uh, I'm not as touchy-feely, you know, as, as maybe I should be. You know what I mean? I, I, I should always be hugging on my kids. And I don't. I don't. She, she is the, she, I call her the coddler, right? You're, you're the one that's going to make sure that they are taken care of. When it comes down to it, if there is a scratch, mommy is the one that takes care of that scratch, right? Daddy says, use your other leg, okay? <laughs> but listen, Somebody sits in your lap. There's a man that, that recently told of a time his eight-year-old daughter came from school. Uh, she'd had a, a pretty difficult day and uh, seemed pretty sad. She asked him if he could actually sit on his lap, and she climbed onto his lap and sat there for the uh, 
that are part of 20 minutes without ever saying a word. Didn't say anything. Do you think the father is upset with that? I don't think so. It, it meant much more to him, probably more than it did to him as it, is, it did his daughter. Because she was in his lap because she just wanted it, wanted to be with him. She wanted to be with him. I want you to repeat with me the next phrase of the Lord's Prayer. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. All right, stop there. Notice that Jesus gives us permission to ask for things. Do you understand that? There's nothing wrong with approaching your Heavenly Father about your needs and your hurts. And there's nothing too small to pray, to pray about. Uh, you can buy a loaf of bread at the store for about two bucks. But Jesus say, you, you have permission to ask about even the simple things, like bread, like bread. Nothing's too small to be a concern for your father. He will take care of you. You ask, he will give. And guess what? Sometimes we ask and he doesn't give us what we want, right? But sometimes what we want is what we need. God gives us what we need also. Jesus gives us that permission to speak to the Father for what we need. Now repeat with me the, the words that Jesus uses to end this prayer. He says, For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You know, I used to think of these words as kind of like a, a throwaway phrase, almost like a, uh, like a sincerely mat, right? Like at the end of a letter. But those words, they actually mean far more than that. Uh, they, they mean that we come and pray confidently before God because it's His kingdom. It's His kingdom. And He gets all the power and the glory. It's His kingdom. And our prayers, God is the right place to go because that's where all the power is. Do you understand that this world has no power? Satan has no power. God has all the power. God is our provider. God is the one that gives us what we need. When we have issues, he's there for us. We try to do things on our own. Sometimes we'll find empty roads or dead ends. God gives us what we need. As the worship team comes forward, Some of the past assignments you've had were to read a chapter of Proverbs a, a day. Okay. Um, to sell something that you have and give it to somebody in need. I've heard some stories from you. And you know, unlike a school assignment, this is an assignment that you don't get a grade on from me. These are assignments that you do, not because you're obligated to do them, but because you need to, but because you desire to. So I'm going to give you an assignment this week. This isn't the last assignment you'll have, but this is an assignment to kind of end this series. And it is, it is to set aside time at least once this week where you go off by yourself and focus on God. And the key here is focusing on your mind on God and Him alone. Him alone. When you get done, just be still. Be still. I'm not talking about praying five times a day. God doesn't require that. You understand that? He doesn't require that. You know why? Because He gave all. He gave us what we need. He gave us freedom from sin. He gave us His Son. Understand that. That debt has been paid. People don't really understand that. If I mess up on this world, I've got a debt to pay. If I mess up on this world... And I wanted to get to heaven. Jesus paid my debt already. Understand that.
Don't ask him for anything. Just fill your mind with him. You can ask anything you want later, but for that period of time, give him your total attention and love. See, that's a powerful way to pray, but it can only be completely powerful if you belong to Jesus. Amen? That's the only way it works. That's why we have this time at the end of a service where we all have to look at our own lives and say, well, maybe uh, I've never actually made that choice to follow Jesus and to accept him as my Savior. Because otherwise, everything that I'm talking about here doesn't mean anything. Without Jesus, that connection between us and God is gone. Without Jesus, you, without accepting him as your Lord and Savior, there's only two directions to go. I plan on going the direction to be up there on those streets of gold. And I hope each one of you can join me. But I've been forgiven. And that's the choice you have to make this morning. If I have never accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior, I can do it now. I can decide that I want to give up my life. I want to give up my own will. And I want to follow Jesus. I want to follow God. I want Him to be in control. That's what He wants. And no, there's not a ritual that we have to go through. It's believing that Jesus is the Son of God. He's our Lord and Savior. He died for our sins. We can be buried of this world and reborn in God's. That's it. So maybe you need to make that decision today. This is the time to do it. Maybe you've fallen away. Maybe, maybe you just haven't had time for, for God. You know, my schedule's real busy. I haven't had time for prayer. Maybe you just feel like I need to come back. Again, it's like that dad that is sitting there on a chair waiting for that daughter to come and jump on his lap. That's what he's waiting for right now, for you to decide, I'm coming back. I want to be with you. Maybe you need to make that decision. You're a believer, and I just need to come back to God and make him the focus of my life. Maybe you've decided today that you want to be part of a body of Christ that can help do that, that can help others to make that decision, because that's why we're here be his body on earth. Maybe you're ready to make that decision to join. We all have decisions to make this morning. Please stand as we sing this final song.